What's going on, guys? Welcome to Alive in Christ. Hope you guys are doing well. All right, so today we're going to be taking a look at some particular false teachers who claim to be understanding John 2.19. And we're going to listen to both of their takes. I have some clips as well as the quotations that I'm going to be showing in case uh, they get upset and cry that I'm using their footage, even though it's fair use. If they do that, I still have the slides. So what I want to do, guys, is show you how to deal with this objection, because basically John 2.19, where Jesus Christ is talking about raising himself up, the people who come against Jesus being God, the people who come against the Trinity, they have to try to bring an objection against this. And so as we're going to see in the clip, one of the objections will be, quote unquote, they go along the line of uh, talking about soul sleep. So we're going to deal with issuing it from there. Uh, dealing with it from that angle. We're also going to deal with uh, an objection from Common, who, if you guys don't know, he's the guy that loves to do an entire channel against the Trinity, but doesn't like to actually talk to people who believe in the Trinity. He likes to make an entire channel against the Trinity, and then if you want to have an, a discussion or something, he'll say, no, 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 no. I don't talk to you Trinitarians. So anyway, we're going to deal with that. Um, because I had sent him an email as well. Uh, but I want to go ahead and get started. Now, I know you guys know that uh, the channel, we're doing a lot more Bible study, and that is the direction I'm going because I'm interested in you guys growing spiritually. We're going to get into talking about the ministry gifts of the Spirit soon. Uh, we're going to be getting into a lot of other topics, but I just wanted to deal with this because it was brought to my attention, and then I saw somebody else bringing the a different objection, but against the same verse, John 2, 19. And I said, what is going on? Why are all the heretics, I guess they're inspired by the same demons, still coming against John 2, 19? This needs to be dealt with. So we're going to deal with it, and let's, uh, let's jump right into it. So here's the clip. Here's the clip, guys. We're going to get started. This is um, Common, who's going to be talking. He's at the bottom on the screen. He goes by, quote-unquote, Christian man. And he's on a Muslim's uh, platform. I'm not sure uh, what channel this is. I just know that they get on Discord together. Apparently, he feels comfortable going on a Muslim channel, but not on somebody who believes in the Trinity. Uh, so let's go ahead and uh, play it. And you guys can hear for yourself the objection. And then I'll show you the quote as well. All right. Right now, the, the, the Greek on this literally means to rise up doesn't say i will raise it up agurio does not include i will raise it up again okay the greek literally means in trice hey mira agurio otos it means that i will rise up again not i will raise it up again so if i click on it and i look at all the other instances joseph awoke okay this is literally what it means agurio uh he got up he arose uh joseph got up he arose he arose joseph got up he rose up he came up, he got up, right? I rise, he got up, he got up, have risen, got up, got up, got up. All the other instances of a gurio simply means to rise up. So destroy this temple in three days and I will rise up again. Not I will raise it up again. That's not in the Greek, okay? So Now let's deal with that. I'm going to show you guys exactly what he said because I know that it might have been hard to follow on there. That was the timestamp. So what is the objection? The objection is, he says, the Greek on this literally means to rise up. Doesn't say, I will raise it up. That's the first objection. Then he says, a gyro does not include, I will raise it up again. We're going to deal with that. And then another objection he says was, so destroy this temple in three days and I will rise up again, not I will raise it up again. That's not in the Greek. That's the objections. I have it in the quotation. That's from the clip that we just saw. So we're going to deal with this. Now, what I found, um, you know, amusing was that when Common, he's always talking about context and you hear him rambling, uh, he arose, he arose, he arose, he got up, he arose, he got up, he arose, he got up. He kept saying that, going over uh, the account and how that word is used with Joseph. Common, I know that you don't actually read the Bible, but if you look at the context when that word is used, 
about Joseph rising up, it's because he was asleep. And there's a thing called context, so that when someone's asleep and they rise up, they're not being resurrected, okay? And the reason we know that is because of context. So going to Joseph and trying to use that as a basis, as if it's analogous to what's going on in, Ju- in John 2.19 is bogus. It's ridiculous. And this is probably the worst objection that I've ever heard related to John 2.19. Even Carlos Xavier, which we're going to deal with his objections, his are bad. His objections are bad. But at least Carlos will try to spin it to make it seem a certain way. Common just completely takes a verse that's a completely different context about somebody sleeping physically to use that as a basis for his definition on the Greek word. Terrible. And you say you understand the Bible. All right, so let's look at this, guys. I'm going to go to it, as you, uh, as you guys can see. Number one, a gyro is first person singular. What does that mean, class? That means I. First person singular. And I'm going to put it here on the screen so you guys can see it. The word agairo is future tense. What does that mean? I will. Okay? So this is just looking at it from the Greek. Agairo is in the first person singular active. What does active mean in the Greek? And common, since you claim to act like you know Greek, what does the active indicate? That indicates that Christ is the one who is performing the action. Okay? Now... I'm going to go to the verse and come back. So this is the verse. Jesus answered and said to them, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. Stop. Why is he even mentioning this? Why is Jesus even saying this? How about we actually look at what came about? Because when we look at this, notice what's going on. Jesus, he made a whip of cords. He drove them all out of the temple with the sheep, the oxen, poured out the changers' money and overturned the tables. What did Jesus say? He said to those who sold doves, take these things away. Do not make my father's house a house of merchandise. Hmm. It sounds like Jesus is exercising authority over the temple, right? That's exactly what's going on. So then what else happens? Then his disciples remembered it was written, zeal for your house has eaten me up. So the Jews answered and said to Jesus, what sign do you show to us since you do these things? It's very important you read the verse before to understand context. You can claim that you're reading context all day. You can shout the word context all day. You can say, oh, you got to look at the context. You got to look at the context. You can say that all day. But if you don't actually practice looking at the context, then your words are empty. So what we're doing is we're actually looking at the context, at the verses that come before and the verses that come after. So they're asking him, what What sign do you show to us since you do these things? Since you do what things? What is he doing? He's exercising authority over the temple. He's saying, take these things away. Do not make my father's house a house of merchandise. And the Jews, they're upset with Jesus. They're wondering, basically, who do you think you are? Now, what does he say? When they say, what sign do you show to us since you do these things? What does Jesus say? Jesus answered and said to them, destroy this temple, this temple. And in three days, I will raise it up. What temple is he talking about? You don't have to guess. John's going to tell you. The Jews said it's taken 46 years to build this temple. What temple are they talking about? The Jews are talking about the physical temple. And they say, well, you raise it up in three days. But Jesus wasn't talking about the physical temple, was he? He was talking about what? He was speaking of the temple of his body. Right? It tells you right there. You don't have to guess. So the this temple is talking about his body. That's what the context says. Now, why is that important? Because what did he say? He says right here, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. I will raise it up. 
what is he going to raise up? His body. How do we know he's talking about his body? Because John tells us. So the it, I will raise it up, is referring to what? His body. Who's going to raise up his body? Does he say, my father only will raise it up? No, he says, I will raise it up. How do we know he's talking about himself raising it up? Because we actually go to the Greek, since you want to go to the Greek common, or at least pretend that you do. The word agairo here is future tense. I will. First person singular. I. I will. And then the voice there is what? Active. What does active indicate? That means that Jesus himself is performing the action. Jesus himself will raise it up. It's not in the passive. It's in the active. Did you get that? So if I'm being firm here, it's because these people pretend to go by scripture, but they are blinded by their father, the devil. And this is why they have to abuse the text. And I'm passionate about this, not because I'm full of hate, but because I'm full of zeal for people to not be blinded by these serpents, because that's what they are. I don't sugarcoat it. I'm not going to sugarcoat it. So having said that, when we go back, Agairo's in the first person singular active to denote that Christ is the one who will perform the action. What is the action? He's talking about raising up his body. That's what he's talking about. Now, how do we know about the it, raise it up? Because remember what Common said, it's up here on the quotations. What does he say? He says, Agairo does not include, I will raise it up again. And then he says, so destroy this temple in three days and I will rise up again, not I will raise it up again. That's not in the Greek. Well, come in, raise it up because the word here, altas, is going to be it, right? That's the word. And it refers to what? The temple, the body of Christ. But since you like to go to Bible Hub, I'm going to go to Bible Hub so you can see it. Here's Bible Hub. And notice what it says here. Let me zoom in so you can see it. Okay, let's zoom in so you can see it. Destroy this temple, and in three days, I will raise it up, right? I will raise it up. There's the it right there. That's the word it. What's the it in the context? The temple. What temple is he referring to? His body. How do we know? Because John tells us. Okay, it's very clear. This is not... This is not even a strong objection, guys, but I'm having to do it because I just know that with these people out here, we have to have also people who are going to rise up and call it out, okay? Now, another thing to note here, because false teachers always misrepresent the position, okay? The argument is not, I will raise it up again. That's not what we're saying. The argument is that Christ will be conscious to actively raise his own body. And he has authority in union with the Father and the Holy Spirit. Because the scriptures talk about the Father raising up Christ. This verse talks about Christ raising himself. And Romans 8 describes the Holy Spirit raising up Jesus. Why? Because the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, they operate in union. Okay, Christ is explaining he has authority, not just over the physical temple, but over life. Now, I'm going to take my time saying this so you get it. So to the heretics, to the guys, I know you guys are watching. You guys like to hide in the shadows. Listen, the powerful significance of this verse is that the Jews, they are upset that Christ is exercising authority in the physical temple. They're upset about that, Right. So they're saying, what sign will you show us that you do these things, that you do what things, that you're exercising authority in the physical temple here? And Jesus's response, he's telling them, I don't just have authority over this physical temple. I have authority over life. And the gospel of John in this same chapter shows that Jesus is Lord over time. And I'm going to show you that real quick. He's Lord over time in the same chapter, okay? 
And I know they don't want to listen to this. They won't be able to listen to this because they don't follow the Bible. John 2.19, same uh, uh, verse here we saw, right? John 2.19. Now let's back it up. I'm going to back it up a little bit. And we're going to go to John 2 because I want to show you guys this. John 2, when Jesus turns water wine, notice he tells them, fill the water pots with water. They filled it to the brim. He said, draw it now, take it to the master of the feast. They took it. When the master of the feast had tasted the water that was made wine, water that was made wine. Why is that significance? Because in order to have wine, it takes time. It takes years to have wine. Jesus exercises authority over time. This miracle shows that he's the Lord over time because the water is immediately turned to wine. Wine takes time. Good wine takes more than 10 years. Decent wine, 10 years. Really good wine, 50 years, 100 years. You got great wine. Jesus creates from the water the wine instantly, showing what? He's Lord over time. He has authority over time. Does the scriptures give that impression elsewhere? Yes, Hebrews chapter 1, right? He created the ages, the periods of time, because he's outside of time, okay? Colossians 1.17, he is before all things. He is before all things, and all things are held together by him. It's right there. Everything that's in time is held by the one who is not bound by time. Okay, now, let's continue. We got more. Glory to God. We got more. Because like I said, that was honestly not a strong objection. John 2, 24, same chapter. So after you see that in John 2, 9, and after you see this in John 2, 19, look at John 2, 24. Now, when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover during the feast, many believed in his name when they saw the signs that he did. But Jesus did not commit himself to them because he knew all. He knew all. And he knew what was in man. Again, if you understand the Old Testament, if you understand the Old Testament, only Yahweh knows the hearts. Only Yahweh. He knows the hearts. He's all-knowing. And in Revelation 2, 23, we see it again. I'm not going to go there. That's another reference. Revelation 2, 23, Jesus searches the minds and the hearts, which is a quotation from Jeremiah where it talks about Yahweh searches the hearts, okay? So, again, you're either going to say that God granted Jesus, quote-unquote, the ability to be omniscient, but again, when you say that, even if somebody tries to argue that way, you have to understand there's a difference between authority and ability. And I don't know why Unitarians always act like they got you when they say authority. Authority and ability are not the same. I can give a five-year-old the authority to drive my car. Here, take the keys. I've given him the authority. Does he have the ability? Does he have the awareness, the skill, the height? Does he have the ability to drive my car just because he has the authority? No. So why do you guys act like, oh, well, the father gave him authority. Even if you argue like that, which again, we'll destroy that in a little bit, you have to deal with the ability. So now you're going to be backed into a corner and you're going to have to say that God, the father, gave Jesus the authority and the ability. And yet the Old Testament talks about how what? Those abilities, those omni-attributes are exclusive to God's nature. So you end up making the creature, since you believe Jesus is only a creature, you end up making the creature on par with the creator. And you say you guys do not uh, have idolatry. You guys are in idolatry because you don't acknowledge who the son is. You want to make him just a man and then you exalt him to the same level as the father. And then you want to get out of it by saying, well, the father gave him authority. So the father is into idolatry. The father affirms idolatry. When we see in the Old Testament, he says, I alone, 
I alone am able to do this. I alone am the creator. I alone. He makes exclusive claims in the book of Isaiah. And all of a sudden, now he's just giving it away. That doesn't make any sense. So let's continue, guys. These are not strong arguments. All right, so let's go to, let's go to this. So we dealt with common, pathetic, pathetic, pathetic. Uh, it's embarrassing. Now let's deal with Carlos. Carlos Xavier, always schooled by Anthony Buzzard. All right. I'm sure Sir Anthony Buzzard will be proud of him. So when we look at this, we're going to play the clip at the 58 second mark. Let's play the clip. This is going to be Carlos. Bible describes death as sleep. Now you can read Paul dying as sleeping. Example, Paul, about those who are asleep in. So let me just give you a background. He's trying to argue that sleep is, well, I'll let him play it, but he's basically promoting soul sleep. The Bible describes death as sleep. He says the Bible describes death as sleep. Now watch what he tries to do. Now you can read Paul dying as sleeping. Example, Paul, about those who are asleep in Christ will be awakened at his coming, for example. Uh, the Old Testament, Ecclesiastes 9.5, for the living know that they will die, but the dead do not know anything. So the state of the dead is dead. You're dead. You're not alive. You're asleep. You're not awake. It also teaches the Bible that when you die, the breath of life, the spirit, as some translate it, goes back to God who gave it. So if now, why is he trying to argue this way? Because Carlos does not want to have to deal with the fact that Jesus is conscious and able to raise himself up. So now he's going to the soul sleep and he starts to try to use Ecclesiastes. Now we're going to deal with that argument. Okay. This is what he said. I have it here on the screen. He says, you can read Paul dying as sleeping. For example, Paul, about those who are asleep in Christ, will be awakened at his coming. Then he says the Old Testament, Ecclesiastes 9.5, and then he tries to quote it. For the living know that they will die, but the dead do not know anything. So then Carlos says, so the state of the dead is dead. You're not alive. You're asleep. You're not awake. The breath of life goes back to God. Then he says, resurrection was an act, not of Jesus, but of God. Now, let's deal with that. First of all, Carlos fails to realize that the theme of Ecclesiastes is under the sun. What does that mean? That means it's from a natural man's perspective. So if you need to see that, look at the book, okay? Because even in the immediate context, the very next verse says, under the sun, right? And then at the beginning of the book, where God always puts the key at the beginning of the book, what profit has a man from all his labor in which he toils under the sun? And you're going to notice that this phrase, under the sun, is repetitive. He keeps on saying it. He talks about under the sun. That which has been is what will be. That which is done is what will be done. There's nothing new under the sun, right? So the theme of Ecclesiastes is talking about from a natural man's perspective under the sun is natural on the earth that's why it's under the sun hello that's why it's under the sun so it's from a natural man's perspective so why would you take the book of ecclesiastes to try to understand about the spirit realm which the natural man does not understand because under the sun we don't know or see what happens in the spirit realm do you guys catch that? Now, we're also going to show how Carlos is actually contradicting what Jesus teaches, even though he pretends to follow Jesus. So let's talk about that. Because when we look at Luke, this is Jesus who is teaching. So you claim to follow Christ, and yet what you say contradicts Christ. Surprise, surprise. You see this happen all the time with the cults, guys. So Jesus is talking about this. Now, notice what he goes on to say. I'm going to show you guys two accounts here, not just from this one, because they'll probably try to argue, oh, it's a parable. No, we're going to deal with that. So when you look at this, Jesus begins to share this, right? And I want to bring it down. We're going to bring it down here. He talks about the rich man, and then he talks about Lazarus, okay? Now, he says that the rich man dies, and he talks about 
The rich man died and was buried. He died, he was buried. Very clear, the rich man is physically dead, physically buried. But being in torments in Hades, he lifted up his eyes and saw. So he has eyes, he can see. He's in torments, he can feel. He saw Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. He's cognizant. He's understanding what's going on. He cried out and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. Send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue. I am tormented in this flame. But according to Carlos, dead is dead. Dead is dead. You're just asleep. You are just dead. According to Carlos. You guys still want to follow these false teachers? This is not a game. You cannot contradict Jesus Christ and then expect to say that you follow Christ. Now, notice what else is described here. Okay, I'm going to bring this down uh, as we take a look at it. So Moses is involved. He talks about Moses. He talks about Abraham speaking to him, right? Is Abraham a historical figure? Yes. So Abraham is a historical figure Abraham is having a conversation with the rich man, right? So you don't get to say that this is just symbolic. Not only that, if you argue that Luke 16 is just quote unquote symbolic, then you completely strip the meaning of it because the whole point is the urgency and the warning of immediate judgment that happens when your spirit leaves your body. Yes, there is the lake of fire, Gehenna, that is what I would call the final hell, right? There, what Jesus is talking about in Luke 16 is not Gehenna, the final hell, the lake of fire. It is Hades, which is synonymous with Sheol. In the Hebrew, it's Sheol. In the Greek, it's Hades. How do we know they're synonymous? Because if you read Acts chapter 2, when Peter is preaching his sermon and he cites from Psalm 16, which talks about Sheol, in the, in the Greek, it's translated as Hades, right? Not only that, we got more. We got more. This is important for you guys to understand. You need to know how to deal with these people. So when you look at 1 Samuel 28, you're going to notice that Saul ends up going to a, a witch, basically, okay? So she tells him, whom shall I bring up for you? He said, bring up Samuel for me. When the woman saw Samuel, she cried out with a loud voice. And the woman spoke to Saul, saying, why have you deceived me? For you are Saul. The king, Saul, said to her, don't be afraid. What did you see? The woman said to Saul, I saw a spirit ascending out of the earth. So he said, what is this form? She said, an old man is coming up. Now, lest you say that this is not really Samuel, look at the next verse. It says, and in, the, in this verse here, Saul perceived that it was Samuel. Then it goes in the next verse. Now Samuel said to Saul, that is the narrator, the Holy Spirit. The narrator says, now Samuel said to Saul, why have you disturbed me by, uh, disturbed me by bringing me up? So he's talking to Saul. He's having a conversation. Hey, but I thought that the dead are dead. But you see, he's having a conversation, right? So this is Samuel having a conversation with Saul, showing that what? That his spirit was in Sheol and he was what? Conscious. Revelation 6.10. This is another example. I'm going through these quickly. When he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God. They were dead. They had been slain, physical death. And yet, guess what? They cried with a loud voice. They're conscious. They're not so sleeping. They're conscious. They're awake. They said, how long, O Lord, holy and true, until you judge and avenge our blood? Notice that. Here's another example. I'm going to go through these real quick. Isaiah 14. In Isaiah 14, you're going to notice it talks about the nations... And they're going to go and meet the king of Babylon when he goes, right? And it talks about Sheol right here. The English, they put hell, but it's actually Sheol, right? In verse 9. And notice what it says here. Sheol from beneath is, mo is moved to meet you at your coming. And then it goes on. All they shall speak and say to you. 
So those who are in Sheol are going to speak to the king of Babylon when he arrives there. They're having a conversation with him. And they say, are you also become weak as we? Are you become like unto us? And then notice what it goes on to say here, guys. It says down here, all the kings of the nations, all of them lie in glory, everyone in his own house. But you, talking to the king of Babylon, are cast out of your grave like an abominable branch. You are cast out of your grave like an abominable branch. And notice what he goes on to say, you shall not be joined with them in burial. Now, let me put it in simple terms, simple terms. In other words, Isaiah is talking about that the nations who are in Sheol, they've already died, right? They're in Sheol. They're waiting for the king of Babylon. When he dies and he goes to Sheol, they're speaking to him. They're mocking him in Sheol. They're conversing with him, right? And then they mock him because they're telling him, you didn't even have a proper burial. You're cast like an abominable branch out of the grave. In other words, you were not even physically buried properly. So they're mocking him. So Sheol is not just the grave because Isaiah makes the distinction by the words, the word for grave and the word for Sheol. They're distinct terms. And they're mocking the king of Babylon that he did not even have a proper burial. His body had no proper burial. And yet they're in Sheol talking to him. And you want to talk about dead is dead. All right, so having said all that, I'm just reading some of the comments. So that's overwhelming evidence. Luke 16, 1 Samuel 28, there's more verses I could go to. But Carlos, why would he want to promote soul sleep? Why would he want to go that route? Because it poses a problem for them when Jesus talks about destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. Well, in order for Jesus to raise up his body, he'd have to be what? Conscious. And so that poses a problem for them. So they want to talk about soul sleep. That doesn't work. That doesn't work. All right, so let's continue. Let's continue. And uh, Jamie Russell, I might be able to get to some of those questions, but I try to keep the questions on topic. In other words, whatever we're talking about, that's where the questions need to be. Notice Psalm 1610. I just want to bring this out. Christ remained conscious in Sheol. Psalm 1610. So let me go there quickly. Psalm 1610. I'm just going to show you a couple more verses, guys. Notice, for you will not leave my soul in Sheol, not my body in Sheol, my soul in Sheol, nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. Now there, it's talking about the physical body. Jesus' physical body saw no corruption. But there you will not leave my soul in Sheol. That's talking about what? That after Christ died physically, his spirit slash soul went to where? Sheol. Do you guys see that? Okay. Now, another example real quick. 1 Peter 3.19. 1 Peter 3.19. I just want to show this quickly. 1 Peter 3.19, and then we'll go back to Carlos's arguments. Notice what it says. For Christ... It talks about being put to death in the flesh, that's physical death, made alive by the Spirit. Now see, this verse shows that the Holy Spirit was involved in raising Jesus' body from the dead. So John 2, 19, Jesus raises his body. 1 Peter 3, 18, the Holy Spirit raises his body. And then you have Romans chapter 8, which talks about the Father raising up his body. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. You guys see that? But notice, by whom also he went and preached to the spirits in prison. Now, this word here, preached, is the Greek word that denotes proclaim. He wasn't preaching to them. He was proclaiming to them, to the spirits in prison. What spirits is he talking about? Who formerly were disobedient when once the divine long-suffering waited in the days of Noah. So who's he talking about? He's talking about the fallen angels. You find that in 2 Peter 2.4. So I'll go there real quick, just so you see the connection. 2 Peter 
Let me go here real quick. For if God did not spare the angels who sinned, but cast them down to where? Tartarus. Delivered them into chains. That sounds like what? Prison. Chains of darkness. And notice, and did not spare the ancient world, but saved Noah. So you see the context here talking about the angels, the fallen angels that were involved during that event. And you see it right there. So when Jesus went to proclaim to the spirits in prison, it's not talking about him preaching to spirits in prison. <laughs> it's talking about when he went down to Sheol, right? He also proclaimed, he proclaimed to those disobedient fallen angels his victory. He was making known to them his victory. Because why? The fallen angels were trying to stop the Messiah from coming. That's a whole nother message. That's Genesis chapter 6. But a simple way of understanding that Genesis chapter 6 is that in order for the Messiah to come, right, the human race could not be corrupted, corrupted by the angels and men. And that's in Genesis 6. That's a whole nother message. I know it's controversial, etc. But in other words, he's proclaiming his victory there. But what's the point? In order for him to proclaim to the spirits in prison, that shows what? He's conscious. Check in the chat. Check in the chat. Okay. So let's go back and hear what little Carlito has to say on here um, on some more arguments. Let's take a look. Let's look at the 635 mark. That's when he's going to bring another objection. 635 mark. About right here. Temple in three days I will raise it up. I think people hear this phrase as Jesus saying, I will raise myself up. That's not what Jesus said. So the word translated raise simply means to get up or to wake up. So for example, when we normally speak of someone waking up from sleep, right? We're talking about how the Bible describes death as sleeping. So we have no problem with that, right? You wake up. I, I woke up from sleep. But because the context here in John 2 has to do with the resurrection, many uh, try to use this as some sort of proof text. Again, Now, I want to deal with that because, again, he's trying to make it look like it's dealing with the uh, resurrection only. No, the context that was going on in John chapter 2 was what they asked Jesus. What sign do you show to us since you're doing these things? In other words, they're demanding where did you get this authority to come into this temple and speak the way you're speaking to, and to drive us out, right? They're speaking that. And Jesus is showing them what type of authority he has. And he lets them know because Jesus never backs up. He always goes above and beyond to get his point across. He shows, I don't just have authority over the physical temple. I have authority over life and I have authority in the sense that even if you destroy this temple in three days, I will raise it up. Talking about his body. In other words, he's describing the type of authority and sovereignty that he has. That's the context. But again, Carlos doesn't want to deal with what question was asked to Jesus in verse 18. You guys see that? Not only that, how can you say it's just talking about waking up when Jesus is saying, I will raise it up. Well, if he's going to raise up his body, he's what? Already conscious. And that's what the scriptures already describe, is that soul sleep is not biblical. And uh, to repair the breach, I did not know that Justin Martyr spoke on that. That's interesting. I'll have to look in into that. I did not know Justin Martyr spoke on that, uh, what I was describing earlier. So, at the timestamp, he says, I think people hear this, referring to John 2, 19, as Jesus saying, I will raise myself up. And then he says, that's not what Jesus said. So the word translated raise simply means to get up or to wake up. Now you see how they try to water down what Jesus is saying because he wants to abandon the context. Jesus is speaking why he has authority over the physical building, the temple. And since he has authority over the temple of his body, he has the authority over life, which is exactly what the Gospel of John describes. 
For example, if you look at John 10, 17 and 18, he says, For this reason the Father loves me, because I lay down my life, that I may take it up again. Who lays it down? He does. Who takes it up again? He does. No one takes it from me. How much more simple can he make it? He says it right there. It's so clear. Glory to God. No one takes it from me. I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down and I have authority to take it up again. Now, what he says here, this charge I received from my father, that's where Carlos is going to try to use that as a loophole. And we're going to see when he does that at the 353 mark. So let's go there so you guys can hear it. 353. Let's back it up. Right here. Notice what he says. Now, it's true. Jesus says, I will raise the dead. But he says it in the context of an authority that was given to him by God. For example, if you go to the so-called Lord's Prayer, the prayer of Jesus to God the Father in chapter 17, Jesus says, uh, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son that your son may glorify you. For you granted him authority over all people so that he may give eternal life to all those you have given him. Jesus is giving an authority to raise the dead certainly but again the fact that jesus himself says i have been given this doesn't mean jesus was god now again carlos once again demonstrating he doesn't understand the trinity and it's sad because this guy has had i don't know how many debates that he brags about he's had over 20 debates 50 debates and yet he still does not either understand the trinity or he intentionally misrepresents because again the father is the source of the divine nature. The Son eternally partakes of that divine nature. That's why the Father is called unbegotten God. That's why the Son, right, is identified as begotten, not created. The Son eternally partakes of that divine nature. The divine nature of who? He takes of the divine nature of His Father, Father, Son. The Son eternally partakes of that divine nature, hence He is eternally begotten, not created. The Father, as the eternal source of the Son's divine nature, is head over the Son. He has authority over the Son. This does not refute the Son as being able to raise Himself from the dead, and it shows that Carlos assumes that only the Father is God and assumes that given authority in John 17 was at a point in time, but it was not at a point in time, because the scriptures are emphatic that the Son has always been with the Father, and the Son has always had the same divine nature as the Father. Because if you actually read the prologue, which again, this is something they don't want to deal with, in beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Now, I'm not going to go into all of this because I've done videos on this, guys, but this is a pre-verbal predicate nominative. In other words, God here is describing the nature of the word, and the word was is that verb ain, ain, and it's in the imperfect tense. In other words, as far back as you go, the word has always been fully God. Not that he's the father. That's why it's a predicate nominative. And I've done videos on that. I'm not trying to get too grammatical. But that's why the definite article, the definite article, ha, or the, is not placed before uh, the word for God in John 1.1c. Because John is not saying that the son is the father. He's not doing that. Rather, he's describing the nature of the logos. And how does he do that? Because it's a pre-verbal predicate nominative, and it's describing the nature of the Logos, the nature of the Word. And you see that same grammar in John 1, 14, and the Word became flesh, right? Sarks again, it's up, that word for flesh, right? The Word became flesh. It's describing the nature of the Logos. At a point in time, John 1, 14, he became flesh. So... You also find it uh, in other passages such as uh, 1 John, right? 
God is love. And the grammar and the structure there, again, I'm not trying to get too technical there, but the grammar and the structure there shows that it's demonstrating, it's describing the nature, the nature. So the word was always God. God there is describing the nature of the Logos. As far back as you go, he's always been fully divine, always. And that's what John communicates. And if you still don't believe me on that, go to John 1, 4, and it says, in him was life. The word was is again in that imperfect tense, that verb ain. As far back as you go, in him was always life. No stopping point, no beginning point. In him was always life. John 1, 4. So John communicates it. If that's not enough, he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. John eleven twenty six. 26, I am the resurrection and the life. He rebukes the Pharisees, but you are not willing to come to me that you may have life. So Carlos wants to give the impression that Jesus was given the authority to give life right, at a point in time, when actually, if you stick with the prologue, the prologue already told you that he's always been fully God, he's always been with the Father, and in him was always life because he's the source of life in union with the Father. Prologue already told you that. But if you abandon the prologue, and you just go to John 17, and you read it from a natural standpoint, oh, given, that must be at a point in time. How can it be in time when he's always been with the Father? And the Word was always with God. Do you guys see that? All things were created through him. He's not on the side of creation. He's the one who created creation. And again, I know that they're not going to acknowledge that. They're going to especially Carlos, he'll try to say that the word is not referring to a person, etc. I know all that. But I'm saying that from the prologue, forget your preconceived notions, your presuppositions, look at it from the text. Because John 1.10 is the clearest, I'll go there real quick, it's the clearest way of showing that the Son of God is the word, and he is the source who created all things in union with the Father and the Holy Spirit. But let me go to John 1.10 real quick. I don't want to make this all about John, but I want to show you guys this. Because again, if you don't get the prologue, how are you supposed to understand the rest of the book? He was in the world and the world was made through him. Stop. Who was in the world? The true light. Because the true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world. The world was made through him. The world did not know him. He came to his own. His own did not receive him. Who's it talking about? But as many as received him, to them he gave the right or authority to become children of God to those who believe in his name. Who's it talking about? It's talking about the Son of God. Because if you read John, I'm going to go here real quick. Notice what it says. He who believes in him is not condemned. He who believes in him, in who? The Son. But he who does not believe is condemned already because he's not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Notice that. That's exactly parallel to John 1.12. As many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God to those who believe in his name. Who's the his according to the Gospel of John? The Son of God. Where do we see that? John 3.18. But wait. If the his here is talking about the son and the son is the one that gave them the authority to become children of God and they have to receive the son and it's the son that came to his own and his own did not receive him, then that's talking about who? The son. He was in the world. The world was made through him, the son. The world did not know him, the son. It's clear, guys. This is so basic, right? You have to literally do theological, heretical gymnastics to avoid the antecedent that the his, the he, the him, the his, the he, the him, it all goes back to who? The word. The word. The true light. Because remember, who's the word? In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The word is the source of life. The word is the light. And surprise, surprise, in the Gospel of John, who does Jesus Jesus claim to be? I am the way, 
the truth, and the life. I am the light of the world. So clear. It's so clear, guys. Okay. So, I don't want to bore you guys with the stuff that I know that you already know. I'm just going over that quickly. Now, when we look at this, Carlos fails to recognize that the reason Jesus emphasizes that the Father is his source is because Christ communicates he is not the Father, but derives his divine nature from the Father and operates in union with the Father always. That's what you will see in the Gospel of John. Because you have to understand, he's communicating to them in such a clear way so that they do not uh, misunderstand him. Okay, thank you, Repair of the Breach. Appreciate that. He's communicating to them in such a clear fashion so that they do not misunderstand him and think that he's claiming to be the Father. He makes the distinction that he's not the Father, and yet he claims to do everything that the Father can do. John 5, 19. Truly, truly, I say to you, the Son can do nothing of his own accord, only what he sees the Father doing. For whatever the Father does, the Son does likewise. Can the Father create? The Son does likewise. Jesus turned and created what? Water into wine. Can the Father raise the dead? Yes. And Jesus, in the same chapter, describes he can raise the dead. Whatever the Father does, the Son does likewise. You either acknowledge that the Son of God shares the same divine nature as his Father from eternity, or you have a man, Jesus, who can do everything that God can do, and now you have turned a man into God. It's right there. As the living Father sent me and I live because of the Father, so whoever feeds on me, will, he also will live because of me. John 6, 57. Notice what Jesus says in John 6, 57. He's saying that in order for you to have spiritual life, you have to be connected with him. You have to be united to him. Why? He's the source. So when he says, as the living father sent me and I live because of the father, all that verse is showing is that Jesus is acknowledging that the father is the source. But what Carlos assumes is that that means that it was at a point in time when actually the prologue already told you the son's always been with the father. And we'll show that in a second. All things have been handed over to me by my father. No one knows the son except the father. No one knows the father except the son and to anyone to whom the son chooses to reveal him. Do you guys see that? In him was life and the life was the light of man. John 1, 4. So the son is the only begotten son, shares the same divine nature from eternity. Shares the same divine nature as the Father. So, Carlos once again fails to recognize the prologue of John as well as the significance of why and how John uses prepositions. Now, let me say this real quick, guys, because I know that not all of you can watch this entire thing. What I'm about to do right now, this is for those of you who like the grammar. I'm going to go into something right now, and I'm going to emphasize about the grammar. It's grammatical. This is what the heretics do not like. They don't like going into the grammar. Because whether you're talking to a modalist, especially modalist, or whether you're talking to uh, Muslims, when you go into the grammar, now they have to deal with what the word actually says, not what they want it to say. So they don't like it when you go into the grammar. And they will get upset and they will mock you and they will tell you, oh, you're just trying to go into the Greek and, you know, can I understand the Bible, da da da, da. And they'll, they'll try to say all of that. You make them stick with the, what the grammar says because the Holy Spirit in His wisdom, He has... The word written in such a way, clear, precise language, right, that you cannot just put anything that you want there. So let's see some examples real quick. Okay. Number one, how John uses prepositions. John 1.18. No one has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son who is in the bosom of the Father, He has declared Him. Notice the contrast. All creation is bound by time. No one has seen God at any time. Creation bound by time. They've not comprehended the Father, right? In contrast, the only begotten Son who is, ha'on, that present participle, ha'on, who is continually in the bosom of the Father, 
He makes the Father known. So notice that. Creation cannot understand the Father at all apart from the Son. Creation has never understood anything about the Father apart from the Son. As far back as you push creation, the Son is there because it's through the Son that you understand about the Father. That's John's Christology. No problem. No problem, uh, third place. No problem. Now, the preposition is, I'm going to go into it right here. John 1.18, just to break it down. John 1.18. I want you guys to see this. John, in John 1.18, uses this preposition is. Now, if you read John 13, I believe it's John 13.23. Let me go there first. John 13, I believe it's 13.23. Notice it says, One of his disciples whom Jesus loved was reclining at the table at Jesus' side. Notice the language that's used there, Right? We see it right there. There's the word for bosom, right? But notice the word that's used here, in, right? So in other words, John was reclining at Jesus's bosom because this is the word for bosom. This is not how the apostle John describes being in the bosom in John 1.18. In John 1.18, he says that the son, he uses this ha-on, who is Is he uses the word is the preposition is into is is a preposition of motion into into the bosom of the father ha on is ton that's who is into the bosom of tu patros the father why would John do that John why are you so specific on the preposition John. Because that preposition is into, and it's connected with that present participle, ha'on, it denotes constant, continual, active relationship between the Father and the Son. In other words, the Father and the Son, their relationship transcends time. In contrast, in contrast, creation's relationship to God is bound by time. And creation's relationship to the Father, they cannot know him apart from the Son. So do you see how John is showing how unique the Son of God is? The relationship that the Son has with his Father transcends time. And he communicates that by that preposition is in connection with the present participle ha'on. Now, let me show you ha'on real quick. This preposition, ha'on, so in case you're hearing me say and you're like, well, where is that? No one has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, who is, who is, that's the word ha'on, who is, ha'on, present participle. Now, if you say, well, what's the big deal about the present participle, ha'on? Because if you read Exodus, let me go here real quick, Exodus 3.14, When God says to Moses, I am that I am, if you go to the Greek, LXX, the Septuagint, right? And you see how that's communicated. Ego, I, me. I am, ha, on. There's that present participle, ha, on. In other words, the way that God communicated to Moses that I am the God who has always been and continues to be, that present participle, ha-on. Ego, I, me, I am, ha-on. That's how it's communicated in Exodus 3.14. So when you see that, there's a reason that that grammar is there. In the, Not only that, it's not just about ha-on being there. It's the context. John 1.18, John makes the distinction between creation and how they relate to God in contrast to the son's relationship with the father in the verse. It's the context. Okay? Amen. Amen, repair the breach. And look, I understand that a lot of people don't like to get into this, but listen, if you're going to deal with heretics, if you're going to deal with people who are in cults, you need to know the grammar. You don't have to be a Greek grammarian. But you can do some research 
And you can look at people like Daniel Wallace. You can look at people like Murray J. Harris. You can look at people who do know the Greek language, A.T. Robertson, right? And you can see how they understand these passages just from a grammatical standpoint, right? Just from a grammatical standpoint. So that way that when people try to come against it, you can say, no, that's not what the grammar is saying. And they'll get mad with you. Trust me. They will not like it because now you're making them actually deal with the text instead of their straw man arguments. That's the difference. All right, so let's continue. So we saw that. Now, notice John 6, 46. And again, I'll try to be quick on these. John uses the present participle ha'on again in John 6, 46. And he uses it with para followed by the genitive, denoting timeless duration, okay? He uses in John 7, 29, he says, but I know him for I am from him. I, me, is present participle, right? So he uses the present indicative in John 7, 29, he uses the present participle ha'on in 646. He uses that present participle ha'on in John 118. Why is John doing all of that? John, what's going on? Because John is communicating that the, that the son is constantly with the father. In John 118, he's in constant communion with the father. Is is into, active, motion. It's a preposition of motion showing active, continuous relationship, right? But then if you look at John 6, 46 or John 7, 29, it's showing that the Son constantly is from the Father, constantly proceeds from the Father. Now, when I use that language, obviously, to the Orthodox, obviously that the way the Son is from the Father and the way the Holy Spirit is, is not the same. The Holy Spirit is eternally proceeding or breathed out from the Father, from eternity, the Son is eternally begotten from the Father, okay? So they stay consistent with their understanding of that. But my point is, John is using grammar that denotes ongoing. In other words, it's grammar that transcends time. That's the point. Now, let's take a look at this. Exactly. Repair the breach. John 3.13. Amen. Now, I want to wrap this up. And then if you guys have any questions or anybody wants to come on, that's fine. Carlos, we see that he also ignores uh, 1 John, 1 John chapter 1, 2 to 3. The life was manifested. We have seen and bear witness, declare to you that eternal life that was with the Father, ain proston patera, and was manifested to us, that which we have seen and heard we declare to you that you also may have fellowship with us, and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with the Son, Jesus Christ. So the eternal life that was continually existing, how do we know it's continually existing? Because ain, that imperfect verb there, the tense of it, ain, in 1 John chapter 1, verse 2, the Son, the eternal life, was with the Father. It's that ain, Proston patera. Ain is in the imperfect tense, denoting what? Ongoing existence. And then he puts pros ton patera, which denotes what? Face to face. Face to face. Why would he use the preposition pros? There's different prepositions in the Greek. He didn't use soon. He didn't use meta. He didn't use para. He used pros. Why is John using pros? Because pros denotes face-to-face -face active communion. That's the point. And in the very next chapter, 1 John 2, 1, we see that. I'll go there real quick. And again, I know that for some of you, this might be like, man, this is too much grammar. I get that. But for those of you that really want to dig in deep, this is the one. My little children, these things I write to you so that you may not sin. If anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father. Is John communicating simply in this verse that Jesus is just next to the Father? No, because he uses pros. He uses pros ton patera, intimate relation, active relationship. Why? Because he's describing Jesus as the advocate. So let me ask you a question. Let me ask you a question. For John to be describing Jesus as our advocate, 
Do you think that John is communicating that Jesus has active communication with the Father? Do you think he's trying to communicate that if he says advocate? Because an advocate does what? Advocates, right? Yes. So in other words, in the context of 1 John chapter 2, verse 1, for John to use the preposition pros, face to face, it denotes active communion and intimate relationship. Why? Because he's encouraging the believers, we have an advocate, we have the one who speaks and has that intimate relationship with the Father. But how does John communicate that? By that preposition pros. And I can tell you, Unitarians will try to downplay pros. They will give false examples. They'll go to Hebrews 2.17, which again, if you go there, it's a neuter plural. They have ta there, which is not even analogous. They will go to passages that are completely different to try to minimize the preposition pros. But if you look at 2 Corinthians 5.8, when Paul talks about how we're going to be with the Lord, right? We're going to be face to face in his presence and active communication with him, right? In 2 Corinthians 5 8, when Paul wants to communicate that type of active relationship with us and Jesus, he uses the preposition pros. What's the point? The point is you cannot bypass the significance of the prepositions and the grammar that John implements in the Gospel of John and just uh, doesn't really matter. So what if he uses pros? What does pros mean? You know, you can't have that attitude because there's different prepositions in Greek, right? And so for him to use it inspired by the Holy Spirit, don't tell me that you believe the scriptures are God-breathed and then you want to make light of the type of prepositions that the apostles pinned down. The Holy Spirit inspired them to describe the things that way. The Holy Spirit, the Spirit of truth. So that means when we see the prepositions, we have insight into the specific understanding that the Holy Spirit wants us to have. And you're either going to accept that or you're going to try to water it down and say, well, pros, you know, and you're going to try to water it down. But again, I say to you, 1 John in the context, 1 John chapter 1, 2 to 3, in the context of the relationship between the Father and Son, he uses pros and he uses that verb ain again, just like he did in the Gospel of John when he's describing the word that was always with God. That verb ain is there, pros is there. Hmm, sounds like John is describing the same truth again. He is. He is. Yeah, so that's the context, guys. And if you see me a little sarcastic with these guys, it's because I don't respect them, okay? These guys, they know what the scriptures say as far as how we have uh, taught, and they will try to argue against straw man, just like Common did in his objection, just like Carlos tries to do. They try to argue against things that we don't even say, or they try to bring different definitions, right? That's what they do. And that's not a personal attack against them personally. I'm talking about the way that they teach because, again, you might get offended by this. I believe they're influenced by demons. I really do. Because the type of opposition that they give, that no matter what you show them, you show them Colossians 1.16, the Son created everything, the Son upholds everything. Oh, it doesn't really mean that. He is before all things. Ah, it's not really talking about that. He's the exact imprint of the Father's nature. Yeah, but it doesn't really mean that. He's just an agent, blah, blah, blah. They have to downplay the scriptures so much so that no matter what verse you go to to show that the Son of God created everything, whether it's John 1.3, whether it's Hebrews 1.2, whether it's Colossians 1.16, whether it's 1 Corinthians 8.6, every single one of those verses, they will come up with something that is irrelevant to the context, irrelevant to the grammar, and they will add their heresy every time they do it. So these are not people who are 
you know, trying to understand the scriptures and you're patient with them. These are not baby Christians who still need to be strengthened by what the word says. No, these are snakes. And I always get, you know, they, they make fun of me because I call them snakes. But again, I don't know what else to call you because that's your spiritual identity because you act like your father. So having said that, having said that, as we go here, let's take a look. So in conclusion, in conclusion, we see in the Gospel of John, John uses pros to denote face-to-face -face active communion. We, see, we saw that in 1 John 2, 1. Paul, Paul also does that in 2 Corinthians 5, 8. We see that the Son is always from the Father, timeless, John 6, 46, 7, 29. We see that the Son has that eternal active relationship with the Father, John 1, 1, B, John 1, 18, 1 John 1, 2. We see that the Son shares the same divine nature as the Father from eternity, John 1, 1, C, John 1, 18, John 5, 19, John 17, 5. And, again, just to add a little extra, okay? Let me see if I can find it. Just to find a little extra. They will try to say that Jesus is just an agent. Colossians 2.9. In him, the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily. The whole fullness of deity dwells bodily. Why is Paul saying that? For. What's the verse right before that? See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy, empty deceit, according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the world, not according to Christ. For, because in him, the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily. Now, church, the philosophy that will take you captive, the empty deceit, the human tradition, if you look at it in context, what does it tell you? Paul is warning you that the people who deny that Jesus is fully God, according to his divine nature, people who deny that, they are the people who what? Want to take you by philosophy, want to take you by empty deceit. He describes that in Colossians 2.8. Because the next verse, 4, because he's explaining why he said that. 4, because in him in Christ, is dwelling all the fullness of deity bodily. That's not an agent. That's ontological language. And I challenge you, for you guys who like to say, oh, Moses was called a God, you know, Psalm 82, they were called gods. No, theatitas, that language there is ontological, and it's talking about Christ's divine nature. Very clear. You cannot say that that's agent language. It's ontological language. It's describing the nature of Christ. You got it? So I know I've heard this uh, a lot of times where people, wait a minute. Let's see. We got a question here. If the father is the father alone, almighty God before creation, then who is the father of father to without the son? Right. Well, John 6, 57, again, John 6, 57, 1 John 1, 2, right? Those are passages that show that according to the scriptures, the Son has always been with the Father. The eternal life that was always with the Father. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. Was with God. Was with God. That Word was, again, imperfect tense, ongoing. Ongoing existence in the past, no stopping point, Right? And the word was God, right? So, again, if you just read the language of Scripture, it emphasizes that the Father and the Son are inseparable from eternity, as well as the Holy Spirit, right? They're inseparable. And so, you have the heretics who will take verses that they see the word give, right? And they want to put Jesus in time in those passages. But wait. If you're going to take the word given literally in time, then how come you don't take the other passages that talk about the son creating? You don't take that to mean what it means. You don't take it 1 John 1, 2. You don't take Colossians 1, 17. He is before all things. You don't take those literally, but then conveniently, when you want to add your heresy, now all of a sudden you want to argue it in a certain way. 
But when the language is clear, oh, it doesn't mean that. So if it says he's before all things, oh, it doesn't mean that. If it says the word was always with God, yeah, but, you know, that's not talking about the son. But wait, we already saw that in John 1, 12, the antecedent there goes back to the true light, goes back to the word who was always with God. And then 1 John highlights what he said in the Gospel of John by identifying the son who's always with the father right there in 1 John 1, 2 and uh, 1 John 1, 3. It's right there. So again, if you guys got any questions, yeah, exactly. If you guys got any questions, I will answer them. If not, I'm going to hop off. So I'll give you guys a second because I know there's a delay. Any questions? So I'll give you guys one more thing. When Carlos tries to do his debates, he tries to take the word one, right, from Deuteronomy 6, 4, right? Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And he wants to assume that one means one person, right? But then, conveniently, conveniently, when it gets to language like 1 Corinthians 8, 6, when it's talking about how all things are created through the Lord Jesus Christ, do you think he takes that language to mean what it means? No. Inconsistency. Oh, it doesn't mean that. It says the Son upholds everything, all creation, Colossians 1.17. Mm. Doesn't mean that either? Wow. So they pick and choose what they want. They don't actually deal with what the text says, okay? All right, guys, any questions? I'm going to give you guys one more minute, and then I'm going to hop off here. What's interesting is you look at Colossians 1.17, the Son is before all things. What are the all things in context? For by Him all things were created, in heaven, on earth, the visible, the invisible, right? Whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through Him and for Him, and He is before all things. The all things in the context, all things that were created, everything that's been created in heaven Everything that's been created on earth, he is before all things. It's right there. And by him, all things are held together. But wait, Nehemiah 9, 6, you alone are Yahweh. You have made heaven, the heaven of heavens with all their hosts, the earth and everything on it, the seas, all that's in them, and you preserve them all. So the Old Testament says Yahweh alone preserves creation Paul takes that language and says, the Son upholds all creation. And if you still want to argue, I'm just going to go here real quick. If you still want to argue, you can go to Hebrews. This is going to give you guys this as a bonus. Notice what it says here. He is the radiance of the glory of God, the exact imprint of his nature, and he upholds the universe by the word of his power. He upholds the universe by the word of his power. Do you guys recognize that according to the Unitarian, a man only Jesus, no matter how exalted you try to make him, a man, a finite, limited creature is upholding all things and is upholding the universe? Seriously? You seriously want to say that? So again, if you go to the Old Testament, Yahweh alone preserves everything. And you know why? Because he's the only one capable, the omni attributes. And if again, again, if you say, well, that's because the father gave him the authority. So the father created another God. That's basically what you are left with. The father created another God that can uphold the universe. So this is why we don't respect them because they are in idolatry. The Jesus, according to them, is a different Jesus. It's a man-only Jesus who they have exalted, and they make the Father participate in idolatry, according to their theology, and they make the Father create another God, according to their theology. Because you cannot have a creature upholding the universe by the word of his power. The word power there. Now do you guys see how damnable the heresy is 
Now do you guys see how illogical it is? And they act like they're the intelligent ones. You want us to believe that a man is upholding the universe by the power of his word. Right. No, friend. The scripture tells you in the same context, the Son has continuously been the radiance of the glory of the Father, and he is the exact imprint of the Father's nature. That's ontological. That's not agency. That's ontological. Hebrews 1.3, and then I'm out, guys. The exact imprint of his nature. Exact imprint of his nature. Right there. Is the Father uncreated? So is the Son. He's the exact imprint of his nature. So clear. I know you guys know this, but I hope that this edified you. I'm going to get off here. God bless you.